Logan Mize spent years in Nashville and he's finding success after he moved away. We'll talk more about it coming up. This episode of Connected with Kelly is sponsored by Pickers Vodka, proudly made in Nashville, Tennessee. So Pickers is a tribute to the musicians whose sounds fill the air in Music City. Pickers Vodka is distilled 11 times from non-GMO corn and it's gluten-free. My new favorite is the Pickers Unplugged Vodka Soda. They're in cans. They are only 96 calories, zero carbs, great flavors. You need to give them a try. Visit PickersVodka.com to find out more or to order online. Hey, everybody. Welcome to this episode of Connected with Kelly. Logan Mize and I go way back. I've known him for years. He came to town in the mid-2000s to try his hand at country music. He went through two label deals and then finally decided, you know what? I'm going back home to Kansas after 12 or 13 years in town. And now he's been invited to play the Grand Ole Opry. So what does that mean, moving away to find success? Is that the new ticket to Nashville? We're going to dive into it in this episode with Logan Mize. So how are you? It's good to see you. Uh, I'm doing great. Everything's wonderful here. So yeah, about yourself. Good. I mean, we're doing great. I see that you moved back to Kansas, and that's kind of where the whole album comes into play. And I definitely want to dive into that. Welcome to Prairie Town. But when were you, when did you stay in Nashville? Because I remember, you know, you came on the show and I've known you for a long time. How many years were you in Nashville? So I moved in 2006, and then I was, I was about 12 or 13 years I was there. So I've been back in Kansas for a couple of years. Um, yeah, I was, I, and I'm still, you know, my management's still there, agents and, and, uh, publishing company, all still in Nashville. So I make the trip out, uh, when I have to, but man, I got, I, I needed to move. I needed like, uh, I started feeling claustrophobic, you know? Mm -hmm. And so I live, I live in a town, I live outside of a town of about 900 people now out in the middle of Kansas and it's great. Do a little part-time farming. And, uh, yeah, I do, I do miss all my Nashville friends and all the, the people I, you know, uh, wrote with and played music with and people like yourself, but, uh, it's been good to can get away. Well, and I could imagine, you know, being here, there's a mindset, there's a grind to it. There is, you are in the middle of the race and you see everybody else in the race with you at all times. And I can't imagine what that must be like because trying to do your music, your way, have your voice heard, but then also looking to the left and seeing what this person is doing, looking to the right and seeing what this person is doing. It had to be it has to be difficult to really stay true to who you are and not try to veer off and do a little bit more of what that one is and a little bit more of that person. How difficult was that for you? It was nice for me because when I was in Nashville, I was always, uh, I toured so much in the Midwest. Um, you know, I think I, I bought a van in 2009 and just kind of took off and decided I was going to do it my own way. And I went through a couple major label deals here and there, but, um, through it all, I, you know, I kind of, kind of figured out I was the audiences I was playing to, um, you know, and, and what I'm singing about and kind of the whole vibe is, is not the life I was living in Nashville. And so I knew that. And I'm like, man, mm. there's going to come a point where I'm just so accustomed to living in a, you know, a cut and paste little suburb of, of, uh, you know, a subdivision outside of a big city that, I'm going to lo completely lose touch with what I'm even singing about. You know, mm -hmm. that was in the back of my mind. And I, I felt like at some point I'm going to be lying, you know? And so it's easier to kind of be myself away from the rat race away from like, you know, it's just such a competitive thing and art shouldn't be competitive. Art should be like, you know, a genuine, you know, authentic thing. Right. And so I find yeah. it easier to, to do that now. I want to hear about Prairieville because the album kind of came about, you were missing home, right? You, you were here, but you were really kind of missing Kansas and, and what that feeling was of being out in the wide open space. Yeah. Well, in 2011, uh, so I, my friend Blake Chaffin 
uh, great songwriter in town. I've been writing with him since 2007. Um, so, gosh, almost 15 years now. But uh, in 2011, we were, we were sitting around, and we kind of, you know, had been for several years on Music Row every day writing. The, and at some point, you start feeling like you're writing the same song over and over. Mm. And so he's from Kansas as well. You know, we met in Nashville, and, and uh, he's like, you know, we should uh, – I was reading this this novel at the time, Willa Cather thing. It was like kind of inspired me. I was like, we should just change, make up a town name and base it on where we're from and, you know, the Great Plains, little rural Midwestern towns out there and uh, just write about the people in the town. And so we we started doing that. We'd write every Tuesday. And through that, we, I kind of discovered my own writing style because initially it was going to be a, a – a concept album and you were going to get to know all the people in the town and those songs are there but i dialed it back and made it more of a themed thing and and took the best songs and put them on there because i was like man I, this is going to be way too specific you know to a location and and i didn't want it to be such a concept album and lose an audience so um but some of it's still there but it's more more of a theme now than a concept what is the theme of Prairieville? Like, paint me a picture of what Prairieville was to you when you guys were writing and, and kind of conceptualizing this town that really embodies all the things that you missed about Kansas. Well, you know, in Nashville, everything is so, um, in country music, um, and I'm not saying to a fault or that I disagree with it in any way, but there's so much, like, southern you know, it's all about the South and Southern culture and, you know, yeehaw and y'all. And, and I know I don't say any of those words, you know, it's, it's, I'm a very, you know, we're from a small, small town, you know, it's farm communities and, but it's a completely different, not completely different, but it's, there's subtle differences in the culture. And I felt like that wasn't being represented in country music as much. And so I kind of felt like, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to stay true to who I am and just do my thing. I don't have to start you know, saying y'all and singing about the South. And so I, I just decided to celebrate, you know, kind of that subtle difference in, you know, the, the Great Plains, the, the prairie culture, I guess, if you will. Um, and Blake kind of picked up on those quirks too. And, and so we both kind of write in that same style. And it's, it's not hugely different, but it's, there's, there's some things there that are, you know, it's more stoic, it's more understated, you know, it's, but um, yeah, I'm, I'm glad it, it it turned out good. I'm, I'm, I like it. I'm from Indiana, so I understand there's there's a Midwestern thing there. Um, and Southern hospitality is absolutely alive and well and real. But there's a Midwestern hospitality that I think people may underestimate or not realize because, oh, my gosh, I can't even tell you how many times someone would bring a covered dish to our house or, you know, like if somebody's going through something, oh, yeah, well, I had to go give them a jump because their car. It's always something about the car or your farm or you need extra hands to bring in some kind of, you know, to bring in the corn or something like that. And I wonder if that's really similar as to how you grew up as well. <laughs> For sure. You know, it's like, oh, it's, it's wheat harvest. Can you call such and so to drive a truck, you know? And, and then the wife brings out like four dishes covered in aluminum foil of, you know, way too much food. And it's right. uh, yeah, it's, there's, there's a definite thing there. The Midwest goodbye, you know, you're like, all right, we'll see you later. And, and then 45 minutes later, it's like, well, you know, kind of the knee slap. All, all right. right. Well, I better beat traffic, you know, whatever right. it is, but yeah. <laughs> My grandpa used to say, I got to go down the pike, got to go down the pike. And that was, that was always the thing. Right. But it, it was still another 20 minutes before he actually left, but I'm glad, I'm glad to see that still alive and well. So tell me about some of the songs that are on this album, because, um, the first one that I looked at and I was like, oh my gosh, I got to hear about George Strait songs. That was the lead off single, right? Yeah. I, I was hesitant to title it George Strait songs. Cause I didn't want it to people yeah. that you know I, I mean that's a tall order brother you just said george Strait songs everybody's like what <laughs> no I, I didn't want it to be gimmicky you know um so i searched for other titles and i couldn't find one that really made sense um so i i, I just kept it and i st you know i still wish i would have dug a little deeper but i i love the song and and i thought it was like the perfect uh you know the perfect entry the perfect opening scene to the the project what was it about 
that particular song that you thought, okay, if, if we're leading into it, what was the hook about that song that you thought would draw people in? Uh, you know, where they still love Jesus by God and no George Strait songs by heart. You know, it just kind of, <laughs> the, the little turn, you know, the fun little phrase there, you know, cause it's, it's, it's true. You know, you get out here and, and, uh, still just hardworking, honest people, you know, um, some of them maybe who feel left behind by the modern culture, you know, others who, you know, are completely oblivious, but either way, they're just great people, you know? Yeah. Um, tell me more about what it's like when you're there. I want to know like typical day on the farm, what are you doing nine to five? I know it's different depending on like what's coming in. Are you guys, what are you farming? First of all, well, so the the farm uh, is my is my wife's family's farm, and right. it's wheat, soybeans, corn, and Milo. It's pretty much all they do, and it's about six thousand acres, I think, maybe more, maybe I don't know. It's some somewhere in that vicinity, I would say. Um, but yeah, I'll only go out there during harvest seasons. So if they need an extra truck driver and they need a grain cart operator, you know, I'll go out there. So I spend a few weeks out there a year, and every now and then I'll go down there and. Uh, you know, help with something randomly. But um, yeah, it's, uh, it'll be pretty much just show up at the farm, like, you know, whenever the crop is dry enough to start cutting, you get all your equipment out shuffled to the field, which takes can, can take quite a while, get the combines, get the tractors, get the fuel truck, you know, and then uh, start cutting and usually go until the co-op closes, which They'll try to keep it open as late as possible. Calling in there, we got two more loads coming. Can you stay open a little longer, you know? And uh, so you can be hauling until like 9 o'clock at night or something like that. And then you got to shuffle everything home, get it put away. So they're long days. There are long days. Well, and here's what I love, too, because you you were right on when you said being here and being in Nashville – there is the fear of losing touch of what that's like. And, and that is your audience. So in being in the middle of that and in working those long days and in being around everybody else, you kind of have a built in like little uh, Q test there. Like you can talk to everybody and say, what are you listening to? What are you like? What are you playing on the radio right now? And I wonder, does that help develop how you approach some of your songwriting now? Yeah, for sure. You know, especially, you know, being out here in a small town, like people listen to music. Most of most people listen to it pretty passively, right? Yeah. So you got to figure out some cool hooks to throw in there. You got to find something that's really good. If people are going to notice it, you know, you can't just, you know, uh, law, law about something vanilla because they're, they're just going to passively listen to it. So if you want to catch somebody's attention, you really got to be searching for something, but, um, uh, you know, that's, that's the lifelong pursuit, right? So did you say 13 years in Nashville? 12, 13, something like that. Yeah. 13 years in Nashville, you move back to Kansas and all of a sudden you get invited to play the Grand Ole Opry for the first time. <laughs> <laughs> man that isn't how you planned it <laughs> no no in nashville went through two major label deals uh not much happened i mean you know I, I got some success going my touring was has always been pretty good we built that that was great so i can't complain about that but um as far as like in the mainstream side of things you know we were always on the fringe even in nashville and then i moved back here i'm out on the farm when i find out my record goes gold and then, uh, and then you get invited to play the Opry. So pretty cool. I can't complain. It is kind of beautiful how sometimes we have to let go of the things that we're holding on so tightly to for things to happen. I've seen that in my life. I've talked to so many people who've said the exact same thing. And I wonder if that's part of what you're seeing now. I think it has to be, you know, cause when I moved out there, I was 21 and over the years, it's like, you know, I completely uprooted everything. This is I'm do or die. Right. And then you have so many failures stacked upon failures that it's like you become so uh, focused, laser focused, like I'm, I'm not going to fail this time. And eventually it's like, I got to let it go. I just got, I, I didn't, I've done put in the work, you know, um, and that's when, when you kind of let go of it and let things happen as they will. I've, I've noticed that's when good things actually do happen. What's it going to be like January 7th when you get to step into the circle? 
I don't know. <laughs> I don't know yet. Uh, I, I'm a little nervous, you know. It's like I, I love that moment getting out on stage and and seeing the audience for the first time, trying to read the energy. Um, but I don't know. I, there might be some special energy in that circle that I'm not even ready for. So <laughs> we'll we'll find out. We'll see if I can navigate those waters. And I know the way that you found out was pretty special. Tell me about that story. Well, I, th- I thought it was going to be like a pregnancy announcement. I wasn't quite sure, but yeah. <laughs> so you were like, wait a minute, what's going on? What's going on? Yeah. So the kids got home from school. My son's 10, daughter's six. Uh, so first and fourth grade, they got home and, and Jill, my wife pulled him into the bedroom and she's like, just a second, Logan, can you wait out there in the living room? I'm like, oh my gosh, what's going on? Then they came out and she had the camera on and the kids walk up and um, you know, that's the first thing you really think is we're going to have another kid. Um, but, uh, Violet first sentence out of her mouth was Opry, the Opry. And I, I kind of knew right there. And then I was like, well, maybe it's a joke. You know, I don't know, but yeah, you, you know, your heart starts racing a little bit because I mean, 16 years it took me to get the, uh, the mothership to ask me to come play. Right. So pretty cool. But you know what? Here's the thing. And I'm, I'm, you know, projecting onto you, but I don't know if you would have the same feeling and reverence had it happened early on, had it happened early on, would it mean as much to you as it happening now? No, I don't think so. Cause when you're a kid and you come to town, you just think you're going to take over and I, I'm great. And this is, this is going to be a piece of cake. And when it does happen like that, you probably never quite gain the respect for everything, you know? So getting kicked in the kicked kicked around Nashville for 12 years definitely gave me the uh ability to to be like really thankful and just I mean yeah to have some reverence for it so I'm I'm really excited you know what I can't wait to watch it's going to be an amazing night um do you already have a set list in mind do you know what you're doing are you going over it in your head I mean you get what two three songs uh yeah just a short set and so uh I try not to think about things too much. You know, I'm not a planner. I'm more of a fly by the seat of your pants and live in the moment. So, um, yeah, I figure as long as I know all my songs well enough, uh, I'll see how I'm feeling that day. And uh, I kind of have a rough idea, but I don't want to overthink it. Well, congratulations and congrats on Welcome to Prairieville. Very cool and love everything that you're doing, representing the Midwest. That does my little Indiana heart proud. (laughs) Thank you so much. That means a lot. Logan Mize, everybody. The album is called Welcome to Prairieville. He's going to be playing the Opry on January 7th. Okay, we've got more episodes coming up from some of your favorites. I would love to know who you would love for me to interview right here on Connected with Kelly. You can put that in the comments. Make sure that you hit that bell and subscribe. Tell all your friends to subscribe, too. We've got episodes that come out each and every week. Until then, make sure that you're staying connected with all the people and things you love the most. Bye.